On the morning of the 7th of May, 1937, Hangar No. 1 at Lakehurst Naval Air Station was being prepared for an investigation into the crash of the German airship Hindenburg. The original investigation would not be long enough. Investigators would not have all the facts, and new evidence confirms their conclusions were wrong. Can experts now solve one of the last remaining mysteries of the 20th century? Witnesses just prior to the fire heard a crack. Yeah, but it also seems that if you were losing gas, that that would have been registered on the indications because right. they had indicators up front. Folks, but we, this is terrible. This is the one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Buried within that segment of the recording, there are two, two essentially there are two events. It's a possibility it wasn't deliberate. Can a re-examination of the evidence finally discover whether the Hindenburg disaster was an accident or a criminal act? In 1936, when the Hindenburg was filmed in Germany by American engineer Harold Dick, airships represented the future of aviation. Their size, their luxury, their magic has never been matched by any aircraft before or since. I flew on the Hindenburg once, and it was over Lake Constance. Uh, it was just a, a short flight of an hour and a half, and, uh, but it was fantastic. It's just uh, floating through the air. On the 3rd of May, 1937, the Hindenburg departed Frankfurt at 7.16. It encountered strong headwinds crossing the Atlantic and thunderstorms when it reached the American coast. Unable to land at Lakehurst, New Jersey, it flew to New York to give passengers a view of the city. Then the weather cleared and the Hindenburg returned to Lakehurst. But after what seemed a normal approach, flames appeared on the top of the hull. Within a minute, the ship was destroyed, and what happened has never been fully explained. Since 1937, air accident investigation has turned into a science. If the Hindenburg disaster happened today, specialists would be called in. But even today, investigating a crash in which a major fire occurs would present a challenge. However, there are new techniques that can discover the truth. In the Hindenburg, information that comes by putting together the witnesses in a matrix and asking for all of these different witnesses, where they were, what they saw, when they saw it, a pattern evolves. Modern accident investigation is about eliminating possibilities to arrive at probabilities. So we have asked experts to consider the evidence again and apply modern methods to look for new clues. Nowadays, a normal sort of time for even a you know, middling sort of accident might be one year, could be 18 months, two years, just to collect the data. The original inquiry took only 18 days. The final report was published before all the forensic tests had been done, and some critical information was missing. The Zeppelin company had an unbroken safety record. The inquiry took its word that the ship was in excellent condition. These days, investigators would go back through all of the maintenance records, logs of the vehicle, and in some cases, they would examine the history of similar ones. Nobody would ever take anybody's word for what was there and what had been done, what hadn't been done. In a modern air accident investigation, pilots not involved in the crash would be consulted. Then, two of the most experienced airship pilots took part, Commander Rosendahl and Dr. Hugo Eckner. But both had interests to protect. For Dr. Eckner, it was the establishment of the Zeppelin Company's transatlantic services. For Commander Rosendahl, it was the future of the U.S. Navy's airship program. The best evidence of what happened to the Hindenburg has survived in hundreds of witness statements. What people heard, what they saw, where they were, have been analyzed as witness statements would be today. Patterns have appeared. They challenge the official verdict that an electrostatic charge ignited free hydrogen near the hull. But in 1937, when not even this theory could be proved, sabotage was considered the most probable cause. A criminal act 
obviously lets the major players off the hook. It certainly lets the manufacturer off the hook and the Civil Aviation Authority off the hook. There was evidence that an explosion took place, but no proof that it was caused by a bomb. For historians like John Duggan, the reason for thinking sabotage is clear. From 1936, airships were being used for something more controversial than sightseeing tours. Flights to the Nuremberg rallies, flights to the Olympic Games, all designed to put before the public the might, power, majesty of the Nazi party. Hence, of course, the big swastikas on the tail fins. And that, I think, sets the scene for the Hindenburg and the Nazi party in Germany. Bomb threats were received. Security was stepped up. Worried passengers canceled their reservations. Vaudeville acrobat Joseph Spa got one of those cancellations. He needed to get home fast for a performance at Radio City Music Hall in New York. He was bringing home a German Shepherd puppy called Ula, and he wanted to be sure the puppy had a comfortable ride too. They let him visit the dog every day, and he'd go and talk, talk with the dog and feed the dog and everything, and that was it. And he, but he did go to see the dog all the time, and that was why my husband was sort of accused, you might say, of doing something that he shouldn't have done. Captain Max Pruss was the Hindenburg's commander. He was interviewed by FBI agents because there was a suspicion that the disaster was caused by a criminal act. He was asked if there'd been any suspicious passengers on board, anyone capable of planting an incendiary device. Joseph Spa's name was mentioned. He was the only passenger who had access to the stern of the ship. They came to the house, the FBI, and investigated my husband. They came in and talked to him and everything, and of course he told them what he thought. It was after the FBI began questioning Joseph Spa's neighbors that news of the investigation reached the press. On this one day, my husband was on the ladder home cleaning windows for me, and I got the newspaper. In the column, he said, mentioned something about my husband as a possible suspect for uh, sabotaging the Hindenburg. Well, I went to the window and I told him he almost fell off the ladder. He got so upset. Joseph Spa considered himself lucky to get a reservation. The ship was always fully booked. Over the winter, 10 new cabins were added. There was now accommodation for 70 passengers, but this flight was only half full because of the bomb scare. If Joseph Spa had heard the rumors, he ignored them. He relaxed enjoyed the trip, and took these pictures to show his family. He had all those pictures of the crew and everybody, and he was going to get some pictures of the landing. And the explosion came. Joseph Spa dropped his camera, kicked out the window, and helped another passenger to escape. It came down so fast. We all got upset because of my husband being on it, and we didn't know whether he'd get off or not. I thought he was just gone. Because it looked to me like everybody would be killed in that. And all of a sudden, a man came up to me, and he asked me if my name was Spa, and I said yes. He said, well, your husband is alive. Joseph Spa suffered minor burns and a fractured ankle. His camera and film survived. Others weren't so lucky. This one man, I, I don't remember what his name was, but anyway, he, they had him propped up in the bed. I think his whole back had been burned very badly. And he just sat up and he wanted my husband to send his wife a cable in Germany. And he said to my husband, he said, just say, ich lieb, I live. Soon after, the man died. The death toll rose to 36, including a member of the ground crew who was crushed under the ship. The FBI investigation found Joseph Spa to be a good family man of excellent character, so the focus shifted elsewhere. And though it wasn't in the Zeppelin company's best interests for him to say so, Dr. Hugo Eckner blamed the ship's captain. My understanding was Dr. Eckner never spoke to Max Pruss again, who was the captain, after that accident. And Dr. Eckner held Pruss responsible. 
and for not just one thing, that is the entire landing maneuver and how he handled it. Dr. Shermer's father was one of the Hindenburg's chief designers. The family lived in Friedrichshafen. Most people in this part of southern Germany worked in the airship industry. News of the disaster hit them hard. Well, of course, there was an enormous interest as to what happened. Uh, much of it we learned later on after Second World War. The findings of the inquiry at Lakehurst were never reported in Germany. Air Minister Hermann Göring announced that the crash had been an act of God. In 1937, it was not safe to express an opinion in Germany after the authorities in Berlin spoke. But Dr. Hugo Eckner wasn't silenced. He was the most respected airship man in the world, and privately at least, he continued to express his view that Captain Proust was to blame. Modern airships are only a fraction of the Hindenburg size. They are not designed or built the same, and they aren't inflated with hydrogen. But the fundamentals of flying them haven't changed. Airship pilots Eddie Wynn and Scott Daneker have been asked to review the landing maneuver ordered by Captain Proust. At some point, they've incurred this before, or, or you know, turns like this. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. If they were going to have a problem there, they'd have noticed it before now. But. Yeah. Here is the beginning of the sharp turn that they were talking about. He had winds coming out of this direction, and maybe he should have made more of a direct right. shot into the mast. Mm -hmm. But you know, this was the guys. This was, the, this was Captain Pruss, who was the commander at the time. This was his first trip in command on a transatlantic flight. Maybe, maybe he rushed it a little bit too much. Did pilot error contribute to this disaster? Did the ship's structure fail? Or was this a crime after all? And so long after the event, is the evidence that has survived good enough to get closer to the truth? One of the things we often have to do in the accident investigation process is work with what we've got. It's all very well to say it would be nice if we had such and such, but the fact is this is what we've got in this case, this is what we have to work with, and we have to make the best use of what we've got. What we have got is a 42-minute recording that was made at the end of the Hindenburg's last flight. Can it give acoustics experts any new clues? The Hindenburg maintained radio contact until 30 minutes before the crash. There's no record of exactly what happened in the control car because black boxes didn't exist then. At the time of the crash, witnesses heard and felt different things. Some of the crew stationed in the stern did not feel a shock, but passengers in the middle of the ship and crew who were near the bow were knocked off their feet. The blast wave traveled to this metal building where a radio announcer and his engineer were recording the ship's arrival. Four or five hundred feet into the sky, it is, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now, and the famous crashing to the ground, not quite to the mooring mass of the humanity and all the passengers screaming around. The four discs that contain this recording are stored at the National Archives in College Park, Maryland. This was one of the first recordings of a live news event. Copies were made for broadcast the next day, but these are the original discs. Since the late 1920s, to record any programs from radio as air checks or as reference recordings, the um, broadcast industry came up with what they call an instantaneous transcription disc recording method. This was tape recording in the 1920s and 1930s. This is the kind of recording one of, uh, I would say one of four or five in the National Archives that has the greatest intrinsic value just in the object itself. Minutes before the Hindenburg arrived, the reporter Herb Morrison went out onto the field with his microphone. What happened next shocked him. 
Get this, Charlie, get this, Charlie. It's then the blast wave right. traveled to the it's metal right. building where the disc cutter was. The deep groove injuries you see in the cuts in the grooves occur right about an inch and a half before the end of the first disc. The recording lathe head bounced up from the force of the explosion. Rather miraculously, the engineer was able to control the recording head and, and carefully lift it back down into the grooves. Can a recording made in the 1930s reveal new clues using modern technology? To find out, a copy has been digitally analyzed at Southampton University in England by acoustic specialist Stuart Dine. Now, buried within that segment of the recording, there are two, two essentially there are two events. One is the arrival of the, of the ground shock, which travels quite quickly, and then subsequently the arrival of the, of the air shock. The separation of these two events indicates how far away the microphone was from the explosion, but that number is already known. It was 2,180 feet. Now this can tell us what the speed of propagation of the, of the blast wave through the air was, and hence we can work backwards to determine what the yield of the explosion must have been. Now that is potentially a very useful piece of information for the accident investigation because it may indicate what actually blew in the first place. Now technology can write the signature or sound picture of such events. Can it reveal whether the explosion that destroyed the Hindenburg was caused by a bomb? An incendiary device will, one would expect, produce a very much smaller blast wave than a whole um, hydrogen cell. But the blast wave from the hydrogen cell would be so much larger and would travel so much more quickly than the explosion from the incendiary device that the two, the one would catch up with the other. Even though it is not possible to determine whether a bomb caused this explosion, acoustic still has a role to play. And an analysis of witness statements has challenged the accepted theory of where the explosion first occurred. Persons on board the Hindenburg heard a muffled sound but before then, some ground crew heard a loud crack. They were standing on the starboard side near the middle of the ship, not at the stern where the fire was first seen. Is there any significance attached to the fact that some people heard a crack and other people heard a more muffled sound? They're quite likely to have heard the same thing. But the people who heard a crack would have had an unimpeded path between them and the source of the explosion. Dr. Eckner believed the sharp turn during the landing maneuver caused a cable to break. Could that have been the crack some people heard? And if that happened, how could it have caused this disaster? One consequence of uh, the cable breaking and then whipping as a result of releasing its elastic energy would be that it provided enough mechanical force to perhaps cut a hydrogen cell. Would a leaking gas cell be enough to bring the Hindenburg down? Not by itself, but if a cable broke, it could have struck another metal object and caused a spark. At 804 feet long, the Hindenburg remains the biggest aircraft ever built. It was three and a half times as long as a 747, but it weighed only half as much. For the first time, passenger accommodation was contained entirely inside the hull. The Hindenburg was as spacious and luxurious as an ocean liner, but it gave a faster and smoother ride. Well, I flew on the Hindenburg once, and it was over Lake Constance. Uh, it was just a, a short flight of an hour and a half, and, uh, but it was fantastic. It's just uh, floating through the air. There was no air pockets and uh, obviously it was not over the mountains so there was no quick descent or ascent and uh, it's, it was floating and you hardly heard the engines and uh, it's like uh, and that you did not notice any rocking like on a ship it was a unique experience of course I was only six years old <laughs> when this happened but I never forget that the Hindenburg flew almost 3,000 hours during its first year. Quick turnarounds were necessary to establish a profitable transatlantic service. Routine maintenance and repairs were done during flights. 
but full inspection of the hull and equipment trials were left to major overhauls. This policy was to have potentially dangerous results. The Hindenburg lost an engine coming back from South America. The ship almost drifted into Africa where it could have crashed. Dr. Eckner was furious. After that, he ordered all section chiefs like Dr. Shermer's father to travel on the ship. Had to be uh, on board on so many flights to make measurements on these ships while in flight so no such accident or mishap could happen. Commander Rosendahl told the inquiry that there was nothing in the record to indicate that the condition of the Hindenburg was not excellent. But new evidence has revealed that may not have been the case. On the 26th of March, 1936, the Graf Zeppelin took off from Friedrichshafen and the Hindenburg was about to follow. Weather conditions were not good. Winds were gusting to 25 miles per hour, but that wasn't the only problem. The problem was that Lehmann who was a well-known supporter of the Nazi party, took command of the ship and took it out of the shed in these gusting conditions and then, quite dramatically, sought with full engine power to lift off and climb skyward in the most dramatic of fashions, thus to impress all the prominent politicians there present. This gesture did end dramatically. A gust of wind hit the ship and the ship struck the ground. Dr. Eckner was very upset, criticized Lehmann and told him, in so many words, how could you possibly jeopardize our ship just to carry out a stupid propaganda flight on behalf of the propaganda minister, Dr. Goebbels. People who were taking pictures that day had their cameras confiscated by German officials. Their film was destroyed. All but one, that is. Harold Dick, an American engineer working for the Goodyear Zeppelin Company of Akron, Ohio, was an official observer. He hid his camera. His is the only known photograph of the damage that authorities tried to suppress. Four days later, the ship made its first flight to Rio. There hadn't been time for full trials of the engines or for a complete inspection of the frame transmission of forces up into the fin and into the structure could have also caused permanent damage to the structure. Damage accumulated over time could have weakened the structure, but damage might not be found while the 16 cells were inflated with lifting gas. The ship's 15 rings formed bulkheads. These were braced by steel wires. If one of these broke, the load passed to other parts of the frame but there was a limit to what the Hindenburg structure could take. A structure such as this, which receives all sorts of loads, both buoyancy and weight, and dynamic loads due to movement through the air, varies from time to time. However, there are certain locations where the stresses are higher than others. Bracing wires had failed on previous flights. Samples of the same specification of wire are being taken to the University of Delaware for analysis. The tensile strength of the lightest weight wire is being tested to determine how much of a load it will take before it fails. And so as the cable began to load up, it stretched such that it passed through its elastic region and then finally became plastic such that if we let it go, it wouldn't come all the way back to where it started. And then finally it failed. It failed at almost 9,000 pounds. Okay. When its surface is examined under an electron microscope, a classic cone fracture is revealed. No surprises there. But the testing isn't over yet. A second sample is tested. It breaks too, but at only 75% of the load. That tells us that even though you make cable the same, that it has some variability. That has to be taken into account during design. Designers of the Hindenburg built in a safety factor to allow for variations in manufacture. But did they think of everything? And what else could have caused the Hindenburg to crash?
experts at Cranfield College of Aeronautics in England are first asked to consider the possibility of metal fatigue. The metal fatigue failure or cracking are results of repeated application of stresses that are well below the structure, the metal strengths of the material. The Hindenburg was almost as large as the Titanic, but whereas the Titanic was considered unsinkable, there were no such illusions about airships. Many had crashed before they reached old age. Structural failure was often the cause. Because of their size, weight was critical. Lightweight materials were used, but they were liable to bending. So structures were made rigid, even though they were operating in a continuously moving environment. Were they strong enough over time? This is showing an experiment of, a, of a, quite an old floor beam from a, a, an airplane cockpit. And you can see it's made, a, made in a similar way to the, the Hindenburg, with lots of small pieces with, riveted together. And you can see that there's been a crack over here probably caused by a, a stress concentration in the rivet hole. Repeated loading has caused that crack to grow across here and then down here. And this is a, a classic example of a fatigue failure. At the Zeppelin Museum in Friedrichshafen, a replica of the Hindenburg reveals how difficult it would have been to detect metal fatigue. And though German physicists were the first to recognize metal fatigue, it was not taken into consideration in the design of aircraft when the Hindenburg was being built. This is a huge complex structure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, minor damage or corrosion or anything else could go undetected for a long period of time. A maintenance log for the major overhaul in December 1936 reported that steel wires were severely rusted. Parts of the structure had corroded a risk of flying at low altitudes over salt water during transatlantic trips. And there was also evidence of metal fatigue. There are no records of repairs during the overhaul, and there is no certainty that all the failures had been found. In 1937, the designers of the Hindenburg wouldn't even have realized the extent of the risk from metal fatigue. What sort of proportions of, of a fatigue load will be to the, to the ultimate load to cause a failure? I, I it's, it's, it's about 50% of the ultimate tensile load for steel. Mm. And, and for aluminum, the fatigue strength is 30%. The ship may have been strong enough when it was first built, but as it was repeatedly stressed, its steel wires lost half their strength. The strength of its frame was reduced by two thirds of the maximum load it was designed for. Could metal fatigue have added to the Hindenburg's problems? Should we see a major breakdown from here? It looks like there was the a break. It looks like there's a, and that could be for all sorts of reasons, because that's where the maximum bending is gonna be. The ship's back broke when it lost buoyancy in the stern. What caused this to happen? And has the role hydrogen played in the disaster been greatly exaggerated? At Weeksville in North Carolina, a U.S. Navy airship hangar built in 1920 is now an operating base for modern airships. This Skyship 600 and all other modern airships are filled with helium and inert gas. The Hindenburg was inflated with hydrogen. Unlike helium, hydrogen will burn if it mixes with even a small amount of oxygen. The Hindenburg was originally designed for helium. The only supplies were in America, and its export was restricted. Dr. Hugo Eckner expected the ban to be lifted, and as the ship became bigger and heavier, its design was modified. It would have double gas cells, an inner cell of hydrogen protected by an outer helium-filled cell. To inspect them, valves were installed. The maneuvering valve was one the guy can control the valve, and the other one operates automatically at a preset pressure. They were located in, inside. And when the gas escaped, it went up a long shaft and vented out through the top. A center walkway was added to provide access to the gas valves. But as the ship reached completion, Dr. Eckner was told the export ban would not be lifted after all. The ship was inflated with more than 7 million cubic feet of hydrogen. The operating risks increased. The Germans felt, however, 
that although there were problems associated with hydrogen, their vast experience from the very beginning of airship travel made it possible for them to handle it, control it, and of course it had the advantage of being cheaper. Even in experienced hands, could this highly flammable gas be safely controlled? Gas leaks were always a given on the, any airship. Uh, even though these gas cells, 16 of them, were designed uh, uh, to be gas tight, they had valves up on top and uh, gas always leaked. The leakage of gas had been allowed for. The loss was small and was compensated for as engine fuel was used during the flight. But when the Hindenburg approached Lakehurst, it was noticeably heavy in the stern and attempts to correct the problem failed. Now that would lead me to suspect that the maneuvering valve or the uh, automatic valve in that shaft, in that shaft that operated off of cell number four, which is the one that burned, one of those valves stuck open. Uh, just enough to leave a constant stream of hydrogen going out through the top. Automatic valves stuck open during the first trip to Rio in 1936. A cell was almost completely emptied before it was noticed. Gas was transferred from other cells to re-establish the ship's equilibrium. After that, some valves continued to give trouble and they were operated manually. But did another mishap occur? But it also seems that if you were losing gas, that that would have been registered on the indications because right. they had indicators up front and there's no evidence of them showing that. Was the crew too busy to notice the gas loss or had instruments in the control car failed? For Captain Proust, time was running out. He had to act fast. It forced the captain to put six crew members up into the bow, all of whom perished, uh, in order to balance and trim the ship for the landing maneuver. While the crew was struggling to trim the ship, there is evidence the Hindenburg's problems were growing. Witnesses reported that there were no landing lights, even though it was dusk. If it's an electrical mm. problem and you've got some major sh you know, short out and burning of, of a live electrical system, um, that could then trigger all sorts of other things to happen that um, were not supposed to happen. Electrical cables from the power plant in the keel of the ship were attached to air shafts and were connected to the center walkway to pressure gauges on the gas cells and to the landing lights. Diesel tanks were nearby. They were spread along the keel and piped diesel fuel to the engine cars. Six days before the disaster, an incident occurred which was not mentioned at the inquiry. Trials were being conducted to see if a maneuver perfected by the U.S. Navy to carry aircraft beyond their normal range would work. But the hook on the Hindenburg's keel was hit by the aircraft several times. This was in the vicinity of the power plant. The experiment was considered a failure. The project was abandoned. But did the attempt damage the ship's electrics or fuel system? Did it create a dangerous situation in the keel when the Hindenburg approached Lakehurst, high and hot? By late morning on the 6th of May, crowds were gathering at Lakehurst. An announcement was made that the Hindenburg's arrival would be delayed by thunderstorms. The ship was coming in from Frankfurt half full, but the return flight was fully booked by people attending the coronation. In England, celebrations had already begun, and to keep to the published schedule, the turnaround time was reduced. There wouldn't even be enough time to get the ship's laundry done. The second day out, a fuel pump in the electrical power plant burnt out, causing problems with ventilation to the passenger cabins. The Hindenburg's chief engineer told the inquiry that the pump was replaced. Then, he said, everything was okay. But was it? Was the breakdown of the fuel pump connected to what happened the next day? The Hindenburg had made its inaugural flight into Lakehurst almost a year to the day it crashed. During that time, the ship had seen hard service. This was its captain's first time into Lakehurst. He would also be experimenting with a high approach to reduce ground crew and landing costs. 
In 1937, the majority of air accidents were caused by weather and pilot error. Almost all the rest were down to engine and structural failure. Could a combination of some or all of these things have been the probable cause of the Hindenburg disaster? A timeline has been constructed using documents from the original inquiry to consider the circumstances the crew faced that day. How do you do, everyone? We're greeting you now from the Naval Air Base at Lake Hurst, New Jersey, from which point we're going to bring you a description of the landing of the mammoth airship Hindenburg. The Hindenburg was flying over the New Jersey coast when a radio message was received notifying the captain that weather was clear for landing. At 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, it approached Lake Hurst from the southwest, traveling at 64 knots, altitude 650 feet. The Hindenburg left Frankfurt, Germany, yes, uh, Tuesday evening, rather, at 7.30, their time, and for better than two and a half days, they've been speeding through the skies over miles and miles of water here to America. At 7.08, the ship passed by hangar number one. After inspecting the field, Captain Proust ordered a full speed turn towards the west. He had winds coming out of this direction, and maybe he should have you know, widened it out, giving himself some more space, and instead of coming in like this, you know, maybe doing the turn up here and made more of a direct right. shot into the mast. At 7.10, the ship was still at full speed ahead when the order was given to begin descent. But when another order was given to turn back toward the landing area, the crew noticed that the ship was heavy in the stern. Okay, here he's valving some gas. It may have been that when he opened those valves, maybe the, 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 the valve didn't seat properly. It's a marvelous sight. It's coming down out of the sky. The mighty diesel motors just roared, the propellers biting into the air and throwing it back into a gale-like whirlpool. At 7.14, the wind suddenly dropped. Captain Proust found himself too high and too fast for a straight-in approach. By continuing his turn to the north and ordering aft engines full astern, Captain Proust gave himself more space to land. He didn't get onto wind. It seems as though, given that maneuver, it was probably at about this stage here that he realized he was a bit behind the ship. I don't want to say he was in a situation of crisis management, but he was basically working a lot harder than he would have had to had he continued out farther to the north. About now, 16-year-old Bobby Rutan left his home on the base. He was heading for the mooring mast. It was drizzling. When the Hindenburg passed over my head, I smelled gasoline. And I looked up, and at the same time I looked up, the engine that I was standing under, the aft port, engine, the propeller was just windmilling. And then it started, they, re, they put it in reverse and it, and it uh, opened full power with a roar. More water ballast was dumped from the stern in another attempt to trim the ship. That didn't work, but by now Captain Proust was committed to land forward engines, then go short burst, then idle ahead. So he's got the ship stopped, he's in position, he's back on top of it, and now he's beginning to maneuver the ship forward against what winds were there. At 721, the Hindenburg hovered 180 feet above the ground, just short of the landing mast. Passengers waved to the crowd below. One of them was Joseph Spa. His wife, Evelyn, never took her eyes from the ship. He dropped the ropes, and as soon as that rope hit the ground, bing. At 7.25, most of the witnesses on the field reported seeing flames on the top of the ship. Seconds later, the ship blew up. From that moment on, for the next uh, 10 or 12 seconds, I was running and <laughs> getting out from under it. When I looked back over my shoulder again, the uh, ship was hitting the ground, and I saw two men crawling away from it. And uh, I ran back to help them. All the crew in the forward part of the ship were killed. But miraculously, 61 people got out alive, two-thirds of those who were on board. From the evidence it had, the inquiry concluded that the fire had started on the top of the ship. The probable cause, the ignition of hydrogen by a static charge on the hull. 
There were no pictures of the first flames outside the ship. The best evidence is from witness statements, and an analysis of these tells a different version of events. One in which the fire began inside, and hydrogen wasn't the primary cause of the disaster, but it rapidly turned an accident into a catastrophic event. They dropped the ropes, but it was at the rear of the, of the ship that the flames shot up, and it went very fast. Spectators may have seen flames on the hull of the ship, but crew who were in the stern had a glimpse of hell before then. As the Hindenburg approached the landing mast, rigger Hans Freund attempted to drop a landing line. It got caught in steel bracing wires, as these pictures show. Freund called for help. Number two helmsman, Helmut Lau, climbed up from the lower fin to release it. When both men looked up and toward the front of the ship, they were surprised by what they saw. Freund described seeing a flash, and Lau saw a bright reflection at the front of cell number four, near the center walkway. Next, they heard a muffled detonation, and then a thud. The Hindenburg's back broke. Had Freund and Lau seen the start of the fire? Why wasn't it observed by witnesses on the field before then? But certainly, um, you know, you've got cells, you've got the outer skin. Um, I don't think you'd see anything until it got to the surface. If the fire did start in the keel, why didn't the hydrogen ignite before then? You could have a major fire down below, and it's, um, it's not going to affect the hydrogen. From witness statements and the images that have survived, there is evidence that the fire began below the center walkway between cells four and five. The engines and the electrical system were involved, and a fuel other than hydrogen played a key role. But Commander Rosendahl, the head of the original inquiry, dismissed a clue when it walked through his door. So Commander Rosendahl said to me, Bobby, what, what did you say? Where were you? Bobby Rutan was walking to the landing mast when the Hindenburg passed over his head. Its engines were hot from being in hard reverse, and he is certain he smelled gasoline. He thought for a moment, looked at me, and uh, then he slammed his desk and said, Bobby, that is not what happened. I said, but Commander, he said, Bobby, go home. If it wasn't gasoline, what did Bobby smell? The reports of smelling fuel, that would almost certainly be diesel, because it vaporizes so slowly, um, it, it's, uh, it hangs around. The Hindenburg's four engines used diesel fuel, which had a low flash point. It was piped between storage tanks in the keel and the engine cars. Under the right conditions, it could explode. Clearly what they've done is they've distributed the fuel all the way along the fuselage. That keeps the center of gravity right. It also stiffened the Hindenburg's 804-foot frame. During the Atlantic crossing, the Hindenburg had encountered strong headwinds. When it approached Lakehurst, it was traveling at 64 knots, 80 miles an hour. Then it was put into a tight turn. The frame was stressed, and so were electrical cables and the fuel lines. Small leaks in the fuel system were more than a possibility, they were a probability. During the landing maneuver, the engines had been pushed beyond their operational limitations. They were hot, and there was no wind or air movement through the engine cars to cool things down. By 721, fuel pipes from the keel were also hot. A small fuel leak might not have been a problem when the Hindenburg was moving, but in the four minutes it was stopped, highly flammable oil vapor could have formed and self-combusted. Or another possibility exists. Diesel oil ignites most easily, more easily than petrol, if you have a drop onto a hot surface. It would be the diesel that would be the most likely to give that little ignition source. The investigators have identified other evidence which indicates that the fire started in the keel. There's these great blobs of something as well, and I don't know what they are, because on the video, when we, we saw the, the rear ballast being dumped, 
They were streams, the, weren't they? They were just streams. They looked like solid chunks um, of water, didn't they? It looks more solid than water, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, At least you can sort out exactly where they're coming from, but that is unexplained. And I, I don't like things that are unexplained. <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder what they are. In 1937, investigators concluded that two water ballast tanks had been torn loose from the shock of the explosion. But an analysis of the ship's plans shows that one of these tanks could only have contained fuel. As both blew out at approximately the same time, it is likely they were connected to each other. Why those two? Why did they burst out of the hull as the first flames were seen coming from the stern? And does this suggest that something happened within the ship prior to the hull catching fire? If you did start with a munition source in the central area, that would then spread upwards, and the chances are, I guess, you wouldn't see anything until it reached the, reached the top skin and burnt through. And before that, it would be um, almost invisible. You think it was on the inside rather than the skin? Well, both. The official inquiry concluded that an electrostatic charge on the hull ignited free hydrogen. The charge could have built up naturally from thunderstorms in the vicinity, or the hull could have been charged by simply moving through the air. In 1937, German scientists tested fabric from the hull. It had been painted with a solution of aluminum and iron oxide to stiffen the fabric and to protect it from ultraviolet rays. It was found to be highly flammable. But in these images, the fire is moving through the keel well ahead of the surface flames. Something was burning down below, and the most flammable material in the keel was diesel fuel. The source of its ignition will probably never be known, but once the fire was established there, it was only a matter of seconds before it reached the hydrogen cells. The official inquiry considered a number of theories, but none of these could be proved. If the full service history of the Hindenburg had been examined, investigators might have got closer to the truth. The fact remains, the thing was a flying bomb. And I personally think they were very, very lucky to get along as long as they did before something like this happened. It was inevitable. Years later, Dr. Eckner stopped blaming Captain Proust. He accepted that a number of failures had occurred. But by then, the world had other things to worry about. Goering, never a great supporter of airships, made the final decision that both ships should be dismantled, raw material to be used for his much-loved fighter airplanes. After World War II, the airship era seemed to have come to an end. Long-range aircraft had taken their place. My father's view was time has passed. It is a historic aspect. What motivates me is I'd like to know the truth. And of course it's uh, very difficult to find out the truth, what actually happened. If the questions about this crash had been answered in 1937, the Hindenburg disaster might not be casting its shadow on airship development even now. The main reason you want an answer quickly is back to the fundamentals of why you're doing it, and that is to find out what happened and why it happened so that you can make recommendations so it doesn't happen again. The lessons from the Hindenburg disaster and its investigation have been learned. Today, investigators can only make recommendations so that it doesn't happen again. But as in 1937, the responsibility for seeing that they are carried out still rests with the authorities and the manufacturers. The Hindenburg truly was one of a kind. Now it's time to let its ghosts rest.